Hello, and welcome to our weekly uh, Zoom chat with the Pocono Liars Club. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about self-publishing and what's involved in it and whether you want to take on the risk that it, that it involves. And our guest here sort of did that, and they'll talk about it, not exactly. Um, <laughs> but these are old friends, Danny and Mike. Why don't you guys introduce yourself to everybody? I'm Danielle Ackley McPhail. I am an author, editor, and publisher. I'm Mike McPhail. Nowadays, I'm co-owner of Eastbeck Books, but mostly I'm the graphic design arm of the company. <laughs> and when Mike says that we kind of sort of do but don't do that, um, we've worked in publishing for over, collectively over 30 years. And we've done a lot of production work for small presses. And they have all unfortunately self-destructed in one manner or another over those times. And at a certain point, you can't trust bringing different opportunities to those publishers. We just went ahead and started our own press, which Mike mentioned is Eastbeck Books. And when the last publisher totally, totally imploded, <laughs> I had to find homes for my own books. And I had over 10 titles at that time, trying to find new homes for 10 titles that have been out for a while isn't the easiest thing. So we already had a press in place, all the framework, we created a reprint imprint, and that's where all of those go. So yes, I am now technically self-published. Um, well, it's, it's not really self-publishing. You, you've set up a business, you set up a publishing yeah. house. Mm -hmm. The publishing house is publishing your book. It's not, it's not like you are publishing your own book. You're going through your publishing house to get it done, correct? Correct, right. yes. Right. So okay. let's talk about what that involves. And the reason I want to go through what you folks went through is mm -hmm. so that people out here who think I'm going to self-publish my own book realize what really is involved because a self-published book will be judged just the same as, you know, mm -hmm. a, a big publishing published book. You know, it's, it's, no yeah. one's going to give you a second chance just because it's when, when it's on the bookshelf, they're not looking at who actually published it. It's a book that's been published. And if the quality isn't in line with what the larger houses are publishing, then it will reflect poorly on you either as an author or as a publisher, if you're going that route. Okay. And so let's oh, go ahead. Okay. Let's say you, you are going to be, um, you have a book, you want to publish it yourself. What's the first thing you should be doing? Homework. Either, there are so many aspects of producing a book that we as readers don't clue into because we're so used to seeing books. And so we know what they're supposed to look like, but we don't really perceive what elements are there. Don't bounce the camera this way. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so little elements like running heads, what pages should they be on? What pages should they not be on? What are the different elements that create, just physically create a book? Where do they go? What do they look like? What is industry standard, the size of the type, the size of the margins? It's a lot of little details that when you get them right, nobody notices, but when you get them wrong, it's glaringly evident. Mm -hmm. So layout obviously is one thing. You don't want to just lay out your own book and mail it in because you're probably going to make it look silly. And I actually have seen some self-published books that were double spaced, you know, and justification <laughs> in the center, you know, it's like, um, that's not what, have you ever looked at a book? Um, <laughs> So, so one is the layout aspect of it. Let's talk about mm -hmm. the covers as well. How do you decide how to get the covers done? Mike? Well, that's my feeling. <laughs> um, getting the cover done is a very broad concept. Uh, the cover has to be clean and recognizable if nothing else. For example, we just had a long debate about a particular cover design. You have to be able to look at it and go, well, this is science fiction, this is horror, this is fantasy. You got to be able to figure that out right mm -hmm. off the bat. If there's a question, then the reader isn't going to necessarily pick it up. They're looking for sci-fi when it looks more like a horror show. The cover art, 
well, there are a lot of sites out there like Shutterstock where you can just basically go along, find an image you like that's kind of in your field and then use it for the base image. There's a lot of problems with that nowadays because everyone can go and use the exact same image. In fact, we had, uh, what was Jeff Young's book? Um, Spirit Seeker, we had a, a steampunk girl and somebody took the same image and we both had different backgrounds and different color treatments and everything, but it was very obvious that it was the same exact image. Okay, let me, let me interrupt just for a second then. You're talking about actually making your own cover. Now you well, yes. might have that kind of artistic <laughs> skill, but not everyone does, of course. You Correct. Know, so the question is, let's say you want to put out a book, how important is the cover, first of all? Yes. Can you, will, will a bad cover hurt your sales? Will a good cover help your sales? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, the correct answer is yes. yes. Bad cover will impact your sales. In fact, I've seen covers from the big publishing houses that were absolutely miserable that impacted the sales. Uh, we're referring to David Sherman and uh, Dan Craig's original Starfist series. The very first covers were almost cartoonish. I remember seeing them on the shelves and thinking, well, this isn't worth my time. Of course, after they did work for Lucasfilm and did the uh, Jedi trial book, suddenly their stock went up. So all the covers were suddenly these big, beautiful military SF and the sales just took off. So yeah, the cover art impacts greatly the sale of the book. In fact, didn't you have one done by a famous cartoon artist uh, for one of your projects? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the plug there. For Big <laughs> Stick, I actually got uh, Phil Fogler, who is a very famous artist who's won all kind of awards for his steampunk comics. So since I had a steampunk book, I figured his pictures would help sell it. I think it has. I don't know, because I don't have another version without the cover, but I'm pretty sure it has helped quite a bit, because people certainly talk about it. Yes, the cover is important. We all yeah. agree with that. So <laughs> if you're, where do you find a cover artist, then, if you're <laughs> wanting to publish your own book? Wow, that is a very broad spectrum. Um, you find one online, you don't know what you're going to be getting. If you're doing it through, say, another small press, sometimes their artists are just completely miserable. We see, in the early days, there was a program called Poser, which was a simple CG modeling program. And virtually every small press used it to some degree because it was an easy way to crank out human figures in varying fantasy outfits. Problem is, they all looked like crappy poser covers. Mm -hmm. um, so finding an artist is always tricky. When you go to a sci-fi convention, for example, that's one of the best places to meet artists. They'll generally have a booth. You can walk up and go and see what kind of work they do, ask them questions, or they're walking around with their portfolio tucked under their <laughs> arm looking for someone to uh, buy their work. So if you're writing fantasy or science fiction, a science fiction convention would be a good place to go. Um, art panels, the art show, mm -hmm. most of the artists that are in the art show that, that are looking for commissions will have their business card and their information mm -hmm. there, and you can see a variety of the type of work that they produce. Another well, source would be go to go to like CIFWA, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, or whatever group is in the genre that you are writing in, and most of them will have lists of professionals that they are familiar with, that they have vetted, so that you know that if you approach them, one, they're familiar with the genre that you're trying to produce a cover for, and that their work is of sufficient quality and their professionalism is of a su sufficient quality that that professional organization is willing to endorse them. One of the I, just wanted, that, I just wanted to emphasize, yes, finding I don't want this to be too much about science fiction and fantasy because that's what we do, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to make sure everyone understands that other groups, other subgroups have their own resources that are very similar to the ones we we're talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Especially if you can find a cover, I think that um, you really like. You know, sometimes you can open up and see cover by and then you just, you know, contact that person online somehow. Yes. Most, most artists these days, if not all of them, are going to have a presence online, either on an art site like DeviantArt or you know, the various places that artists hang out online mm. or um, their own dedicated website. And if you have a name, you can certainly look them up and, you know, negotiate. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to a question someone had, um, going sort of back to what we were talking about with the layout. How did you learn the industry standards? How did you find that out? Where can they learn it? 
see, this is one of the reasons that we were comfortable becoming a press and, um, and being publishers because I've worked in publishing for so long. I've literally done every single job there is in the publishing industry. And I worked in the printing industry, working for the big publishing houses in New York. So for four and a half years, I basically handled all the A-list covers for most of the uh, big presses. So, so I learned it through the course of my career, but there are books out there that you can get. I actually, <laughs> coincidentally, Plug. just published a book called Literary Handyman Build a Book Workshop. And it is specifically about what elements go where in book design, not the artistic aspects of it, not how to use design programs, but what you should be including and how it should appear and some of the problems that you might encounter while doing the work yourself. And I'm sure I'm not the only person that has done something similar, but there are resources out there that you can, you know, go and look for and, and read for yourself what you should be doing. And there are so many books just in the bookstore or in the library in your own house i am sure you have a whole selection a whole library of books just start opening them up and looking at how things appear and where they appear and not everything is going to be the perfect example but if you're intentionally looking for these elements you'll see what works well and what doesn't, what looks too big, what looks too small. You'll start to see the similarities so that you'll know when people are diverging from that and maybe not quite doing such a good job. Let's talk about um, editing in general. There's a question here about how many the different types of editing, what would you need to worry about before you self-publish? And then a follow-up question is, is there software that can help in that development so let's talk about let's make sure everyone understands the different types of editing first and okay. whether you should actually hire someone for that sort of thing and then mm -hmm. where you can find them <laughs> there are several different types of editors you have line editors you have copy editors you have developmental editors you have proofreaders i'm sure there's probably more out there but those are the basic ones that i deal with so a line editor goes line by line um Let, let's, let's let's narrow it down to just the the copy editor line editor people and the developmental editors mm -hmm. how important is it that a self-published author hire somebody to do those jobs for them i would they'd probably do yourself if you really the try. ones that i would always go for without a doubt are developmental editor and a copy editor the copy editor is going to look for the technical aspects typos, grammar, stuff like that. And the developmental editor is going to help you to polish the work itself, to make sure you don't have continuity issues, to make sure that the flow is good, that everything makes sense, that there's no holes in your plot or anything like that. The developmental editor is the jeweler polishing the stone. So are th is there software that you know that could help with someone who at least do the copy editing part of it, I would think. Uh, I don't know, maybe there's software nowadays for the <laughs> developmental too. <laughs> the, the most common one out there is Grammarly. And it is good, but it's not great. Because mostly what it's looking for is very technical writing. And it has features that you can designate that you know, you're writing a novel or something like that but it still tends to not pick up on, um, like I, I was edited, I, I always run my books through Grammarly because there are things that we're going to miss. You're, and so someone mentioned books. Draft Map too. Are you familiar with Draft Map? I'm not familiar with that one, but there's tons of tools out there. Uh, Grammarly's just one of the bigger ones. And it's free, but then as with everything else, there's pay for subscriptions and, and such. But um, it will catch things, but you're gonna have to go through a, an awful lot that you're just gonna tell it to ignore because it's not taking into account creative writing and different usages and 
the different rules that are different from technical writing to fiction writing, that type of thing. And dialogue that doesn't necessarily fit any grammar rules whatsoever. Yeah. Exactly. Um, someone goes back to asking about the graphic designer. I want to bring that up again. Um, do you need both an artist and a graphic designer, or, do, or can you sometimes find both in the same person? You know, to do the yes. typesetting on it. <laughs> well, basically, I'm not an artist per se. I'm actually a draftsman by training but I do know layout and design. Um, I use a number of different programs for what, mostly what I use. Um, I use a lot of old software, unfortunately, which is why my graphics computer has to be isolated from the internet so they don't accidentally update me and I stop being able to use my old software. <laughs> uh, okay, an artist is someone who creates an image. A graphic designer is the one who basically puts it into a format where it can be used by the printers. That's the biggest difference. I met many an artist who has no idea what a font is or where it goes. And I've met graphic designers who basically can only use crayons to make art. So it's really tricky, really tricky. Um, fortunately, I can do both. And in fact, um, I spend a great deal of time creating my own artwork because if it's your artwork, you own it. No one else is gonna come along and produce a book with the exact same design. Plus you can merchandise it. For example, if you take an image off a of Shutterstock and then just throw text up around the edges of it, it's still not yours. You have the image. Um, to add to that, you can pay extra money yes. for a commercial license so that you can merchandise. But that's, that's, that's another else, thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to add here, though. Uh, it is more likely to find an artist that can do the graphic design and layout for a cover not necessarily for the interior. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it is more likely that you could get an artist that will give you a finished cover ready to print, but you might need someone to do the text for you. Mm -hmm. right, well, let's move it along then. Suppose you've gotten, you've hired someone, you spent all this money yeah. to self-publish your own book, which is something people don't realize how much is involved because if you're going to do it right, you need to hire all these experts to make sure your book is good. Where do you go then? How should you, I mean, there are lots of different businesses out there, some of which are thrilled to take your new book and some yeah. of which, you know, so what do the, you do with it? Where do you go next? The first thing is, is you avoid anyone that guarantees they can get your book on a bookshelf mm -hmm. and you avoid anyone with the term subsidy press attached to their name. There are a lot of resources out there for authors to self-publish without paying anything more than like an upload fee. So, and some of them don't even have that. So you have uh, Kindle Direct, which used to be Create Space. You have Ingram Spark. There's Lulu. I don't even know what all the rest are, but there's there's publishing platforms out there. I go with Ingram Spark because they are a division of a book distributor. So if you go with Ingram Spark, then part of your upload fee, which often is waived, you get distribution. So anybody that orders their books through Ingram will be able to order your book and you don't need to do anything to make that possible. You have to give them discounts and such that would be attractive to them and they have to be aware of your book, but anybody can order it. So if you, if you didn't do that, if you went through just the, the Amazon Kindle. If you, if you go through Amazon, it is, unless you pay extra, as I understand it, it is only available through Amazon and, and related companies. So your book will only be on Kindle, they can only be bought through Amazon. Um, audio is through Audible. So that it's very limiting. They make you pay if you want it to go elsewhere. So now you've got a book out and now you've got to promote it, <laughs> which is another thing that people don't always realize. That's what these small companies will do for you if you decide not to self-publish it, but find a company that wants your book. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys do in order to promote your books? What, what is involved? Well, tell, us, tell us what kind of budget you have and how you use it in order to promote your books so they realize what's involved. I'm, I'm, he said budget. <laughs> I'm going to say one thing here. 
Um, even if you are published by a publisher, and that doesn't matter, any level publisher, Random House, eSpec Books, you know, anything out there, any hybrid or whatever, it's always going to be up to you to promote your book. Virtually none of them give any dedicated effort to individual titles anymore. The, the, the ones that get the marketing budget are the ones that don't need it, like Stephen King and, you know, the big name authors that are already going to sell is where they put their money. The one thing that you get out of a traditional publishing house is that your book is guaranteed to be in the bookstore on the shelf for like three weeks or something like that. It, it gets a certain amount of time on an, on an end cap facing out and then it gets moved to the shelf and that's the only guarantee. Um, other than that, un unless you like really take off, they're not really going to give you a lot of attention because they have hundreds of books a month, a week, whatever, that they have to focus on and they don't gamble. So you're going to have to promote yourself. I primarily look for free options because I much rather put my money into the production of the book and the artwork and such. If I can do it for free, I'll do it for free. There are certain things that I will invest in, like a certain number of copies automatically gets sent to Locus. I always put the book up on Publishers Weekly for review, and that, that one's free, which is nice. I will get at least a one month subscription to NetGalley. Not a subscription, but there's different writers organizations will buy a subscription to NetGalley, which is a review site that's used by booksellers, libraries, and book reviewers. And anybody can sign up for an account and you can request books and you may or may not get them depends on the guidelines set by the publishing house. That's where I go. What do you think about organizations like Fuzzy Librarian? Fussy Librarian, not Fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> Fussy, my, sorry. For me, I, I find... And, and, well, let me, these, the, the rest of the questions so that everyone understands who they are, sorry. and other organizations that sell advertising for developing a readership for a new author. I find them more of a hassle than anything else as both an author and a person that receives their emails. Most of the time I just end up deleting them. It, there, there's just not enough time to give everything a piece of your attention. Um, I've done book tours sometimes and I have mixed feelings about those. I did one- You're talking about I an thought, online book tour? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I, I've done one that I thought was a complete waste of time and another one that was a marginal waste of time. Um, in my opinion, the first one, the only sites they really seemed to post to was like their internal sites. So like they might have a group of authors that participate and it'll go on that site and they just post the same exact thing, each one of them. So it's not really getting any traction. It's only, <laughs> they're a narrow little group of people. Um, and the last one did a lot of posting that they just post on Facebook and social media, but they put a lot of effort into it and were continually. Um, have you ever tried buying Facebook ads? I'm sorry? Have you ever used Facebook ads in any of your promotions? I don't trust Facebook. Mm -hmm. I've done boosts, which is where I tested the waters and the results that I got back, none of them seemed organic. None of them made sense for the content that I was posting. And so I haven't really pursued the ads because I don't trust, you know, I have, I have um, engaged with some of the ads as customers and been ripped off. So if I don't trust it, then, you know, from either side of the table, I kind of hesitate to, to proceed with it for promotional purpose. I know some people have, and I'm sure that the ads themselves 
aside from the boost would probably be uh, worthwhile. They would have some impact just because I know I've been drawn in by the ads. So, but again, I try to go for free. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a new question that actually is a little bit closer to what we were just talking about. So I'll save mine for later. What about an author page? Do you think you should have a separate author page from your regular page on Facebook? I actually have several. I have one that's me as an author. I have my personal one. I have one for eSpec Books. eSpec Books has a, a YouTube reading series, so there's a separate page for that. Um, we have a couple established series, like anthology series, so those have a dedicated page keep it to a minimum because you'll just go crazy trying to you know manage all of them you can get help with that you can assign people to be admins to help you out with it i do find it useful i i just just to jump in from my own personal experiences years and years ago 10 years ago i started an author page um, but then I really stopped promoting it because I wanted people to go on my regular page because that's where I throw yeah. up all my personality. <laughs> <laughs> I use the author page just to say, oh, there's a new blog entry now. I, I don't really promote it. And, you know, my personal page has got thousands and the author page has hundreds. So it's like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. You, you I know. do the author page only because there's going to be people that look for it. And it's the pages work a bit differently than your personal page. And so somebody that might see something just from your feed or may not see it because of the algorithms may see it because they're actually following your author page. So I don't depend on one or the other exclusively. I, I let them work in conjunction with each other. So I might make a post, a more formal post on my author page, and then I'll share it to my personal page because I know that has more connections I, I, it's just a matter of your own personality as well as anything else mm -hmm. i felt somewhat like i didn't deserve an author page yet because i only <laughs> have like, two books out you know and no, see, no, 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 on no. Me, you know and but that's just me you know someone else yeah. might, you know might feel differently you have to have confidence in yourself and uh, you can doubt yourself you, in your head but you know me you think i don't have confidence <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, here's another question. Your book is done. How long in advance do you suggest marketing a book prior to publication? And what do you think about pre-orders and things like that? So the only time I do pre-orders is if I'm planning on submitting the book to publishers weekly and they actually accept it. Because in with self-publishing and small press publishing that uses print on demand technology once you produce a book it's out unless you intentionally set the date so that you're sitting on it for a while publishers weekly requires that you send it to them it's either a minimum of three or four months before release date so i will set the release date for what it needs to be for them to consider it if they reject it then i just release it at the point that i find out that they rejected it mm -hmm. and if they don't reject it i will leave it active i will i will leave that publication date in place but you can set an on sale date that can be in advance of that date mm -hmm. the publication is date is what they're concerned with because the the technicality of that is bookstores and such need to have a window that they can order the book so that they have it in time for that release date. And you obviously have gotten to the point now where you don't just publish your own work. Clearly, obviously, you have many authors that you do, and you have a lot of anthologies that you edit with lots of different authors in it as well. Mm -hmm. What kind of headache does that give you, having to take care of paychecks and, and, <laughs> and tax forms and all that kind of stuff goes along with, with running your own business, right? Well, here's the key. If you are going to work with outside authors, and we actually started out with outside authors. We, we were in publication for, I think, two or three years at least before we started doing our own work. 
And if you are paying royalties through a third party like PayPal, then you actually are not supposed to do taxed information on those payments because PayPal will also be making tax reports and paperwork for the amount that they've received for that person. Mm -hmm. So my trick is, is everybody gets paid by PayPal. <laughs> and then it's their problem. It, <laughs> well, it, it, yes. Then it goes through <laughs> PayPal and PayPal will give them any talk, tax documents that they are intended mm -hmm. to get. And their threshold is higher. So they, you may actually not get a, a tax document. You just have to be honest and report the taxes anyway, because there's still a record that you have received that money. I guess what I'm trying to point out is uh, too many, too many people. I'm kind of trying to scare people away from self-publishing <laughs> unless they do it right. And that's the exactly. point. Exactly. Right. So and and we, they don't always realize how much is involved and how much cost is involved and how much paperwork is involved and everything else to do as well. We registered our company, which there is a fee for that. We secured a federal uh, tax ID number. We, if there are certain, there are certain people that we're not allowed that we can't pay through PayPal because mm -hmm. either they don't have an account or they have an agent and the payment has to go to their agent. So some things that we do have to do actual paperwork for, you not only have to understand how to construct a book and when the job is done well or not, whether you're doing the work yourself or somebody else is doing it, you have to do the marketing and a lot of your time comes out of that. I use a lot of free options, but I'm paying for it in time. So I will use a, like a service like buffer to pre schedule social media posts. And then I have organic ones as well, but the, the pre scheduling helps me to do it so that, I don't have to spend as much time. I'm not constantly doing it. I'm, I'm setting aside a window for it. And this is why a lot of people might do all that first stuff, like getting a good cover and getting a thing and then stop mm -hmm. and go, okay, now I'm just gonna let Amazon handle all that crap. <laughs> and there's really nothing wrong with that if you've done, if you've made it look really good and met all the standards. And, but even doing that, if people don't know about your book, they're not gonna buy it. So you have to do certain things. Like I play every single social media thing that I can and every book related, like Goodreads, every book is on Goodreads. I make sure every listing is complete and the cover is there. And if I've done a video on YouTube, I'm posting it over on Goodreads and I'm linking my blog to it. And anything Someone that can post to Twitter or Facebook is doing that automatically but it takes a lot of effort there's a question someone says what was the name of the social media service just mentioned it sounded like upper uh buffer buffer b-u-f-f-e-r and there's a few things like that where you can and and they all have a free option that's limited and then you know you can pay for more bandwidth and more posts what do you think of hybrid publishers um, define hybrid. Good question. Sue, what do you mean by hybrid publishers? I mean, you mean like publishers who will charge you to print your book for you as well as other ways? Anyway, we'll wait for Sue to respond to that because I wasn't quite sure what she was asking either, but that's okay. Um, I've heard of hybrid term, authors, but not hybrid publishers. My, my one tried and true is the author should never pay for anything if somebody else is doing, you know, if you have a contract with someone to produce your book, you shouldn't be paying for any aspect of that. Right. If they're not willing to risk the investment in you, you know, they need to put something in as well. You're putting in the book and all the hours you spent writing that book, they need to invest mm -hmm. something as well. And if they're not willing to invest in you, then obviously they're, they're probably looking to make the money off of you instead. Yeah, and it goes even beyond that because any 
business that makes its money off of the authors is more concerned with quantity than it is quality. They don't need a reputation. They know that there are thousands and thousands of hopeful authors out there that just want a book with their name on it in their hands. And they want the dream of being a big author and it just happening. And so they will, you know, make everything sound good and they will give you all of these options. But in the end, you know, we have a, a good example of the kind of thing that they would do. Um, David Sherman had a book called Get Her Back. And that was done by an actual publisher, but they gave him a say in the cover. And the cover was absolutely hideous. And the artist, I don't think intended it to be final art. I think he was showing it to them to see what, if the composition was good, if it was the right direction. And they said, that's great. So he said, great, pay me. <laughs> Oh boy. And and subsidy presses, which I, I'm guessing is what the hybrid presses are that were referenced to, that's the way they are. Well, if, you does, don't, if you don't know better what it should look like, then they're not gonna say, you know, it needs work. Now, Sue says she's talking about publishers who actually have a staff that works on a percentage of your royalties. They'll provide everything, hmm. but eventually they get a percentage. So you might not get as much royalty for a book because it's going into the production of it. Well, here's the thing. That's basically how all publishers work. I wouldn't necessarily call that a hybrid publisher. Um, it may be their business model that the production staff doesn't get paid in advance, which I would always make me question, but when a publisher produces a book, the royalties are generally always minus the production costs. So basically that, that's just how it works. And they shouldn't be reducing your royalty rate. There's a, there's a industry standard for, for royalties and there's variation in one direction or another depending on the publisher and the visibility of the author, how much they want the book. But, you know, they shouldn't say that you're going to get half of what you would get at a normal publisher because we have to pay the people and that's how we're paying them. So, so your, your point being that every good publisher takes, is going to be doing that anyway, because that's how they assure that it's a good book. So if they're asking you to take less of a royalty, so that they can pay their people, is that fair or not? That, yeah, that, that's, 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 is, that, that's is that what issue. you're saying? Yeah, because mm -hmm. the money the publisher is making on your book is their production budget to operate as a company. So, you know. I've always said um, to writers who want to self-publish that they should first send their books out to the small publishing houses because there's a lots of them out there. You got to find the right one, of course, who research, publishes your kind research. of yeah. But if you can send it to all the ones who have a possibility, one of them's probably going to take it because it's not a huge risk nowadays for a small publishing house like it would be for a big publishing house to take exactly. something like that. And if none of them take it, then you probably should not be self-publishing it because none of them <laughs> thought it was good enough. <laughs> Do you agree with that concept? I mean, if someone has a book Definitely. that sort of fits in the kind of thing that you publish, would you be interested in looking at it? Well, I won't say that we will because we are, we have a business <laughs> model that we cannot open to submissions because we don't have the staff to be able to handle volume. At this point, we are establishing establishing ourselves we're doing a slow build so we are working with authors that we are familiar with the quality of their work or people that come highly recommended by people whose work we respect because the sales 
and building the name have to come. We can't just flood titles mm -hmm. because we fund everything through crowdfunding so that we aren't drawing on credit so that we have a stable platform to build from. That when, when I mentioned at the beginning that a lot of the publishers we worked with self-destructed in one way or another, in almost every single case that handled overextending themselves and not having the financial base to remain solvent and deal professionally with their authors. So we personally were letting ourselves build up and build our name recognition before we start working with unknown quantities so that we have enough staff and everything that we could handle that. When you're laying out a book to send to the publisher, I mean, I assume what you do is you lay the book out, you got it all ready and you send it off to the people who actually publish it. You said you use um, Ingram, right? Oh, you, the printer, you mean? Yeah, Ingram, I, printer. I'm publishing it. I'm sorry, sorry. Yes, your printer, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm getting printer and, and um, distributor yeah. and yes, okay. Um, so when you decide, how do you find that printer and what kind of technology did you use was one of the questions that goes along with that. Okay, so we use Quark Express just because that's what we have experience in. And the other industry standard is InDesign. Those are both expensive programs. I, I don't know what other more reasonable or open source programs are out there, but I'm sure there are. I would be careful of, um, like Kindle has some way that they convert your ebook to print book. And, but I've seen books produced that way and they are not professional. Like they didn't have running heads and stuff like that. So I don't know how they do it. Um, well, I'll go to the next question then, <laughs> unless you had something else you wanted to say there. I kind of got lost. Yeah. <laughs> I got that impression. Um, a marketing strategy question. Do you find social media groups for your genre and then get yourself known in those groups? How do you come across doing that without sounding like you're one of these people who pops up and goes, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, which we've all seen. Definitely. Um, I tend to put my heaviest efforts into in-person events at conventions. For me, that works the best because I can make a personal connection with my audience and I can build on that because then they tell other people. And I, I can't disagree. I can't agree with that more. I can't disagree with yeah. that at all. Um, yeah. Having gone to conventions or how I've made so many connections that have gotten me so much farther in the business. Exactly. Um, social media. I try to find a balance between telling people of something new that's come out, but then sharing other things that show them that I'm a real person, that they're making a connection, that I'm not just about showing my books. It, it can be difficult. It really can. But, um, no, it, it, it's, it's a balance to make. And once more, like we said earlier, it's all a matter of what kind of image you want to get across too. Exactly. Because uh, I certainly know lots of authors who shy away from politics or religion or issues like that because they don't want to alienate any readers. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't care. <laughs> 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 Actually, sometimes I think I've gotten more readers because I talk about those things. Um, but you have to decide, you know, what your image yeah. is as much as anything else. I try to provide content that will interest people in what I am doing. So like the eSpec Books author reading series, those are excerpts that we post online and we provide a link where people can go buy the book, but the post itself isn't about that. It's, it's just about spreading the word and you know, we do blog posts that are interviews with the authors and stuff like that and share those to social media. So people become familiar with who we are as authors and publishers, and they may be familiar with the book titles and get interested in that. Um, I do promote for social media um, when I do a crowdfunding campaign. I try not to do that too much. 
it, it's difficult, but. Now, uh, let's talk a little about the crowdfunding because I'm because i sure not everyone understands what we're talking about here. Do you do that for anthologies as well as for standard novels as well? Uh, and uh, how successful have those been? Have you ever not been able to raise them? <laughs> Every book that we do at East Beck Books, original book, is done through crowdfunding because we don't want to become dependent on credit and we don't want to get into financial trouble doing what we love. So we will crowdfund and we've built a presence. So I think we've done about 22 successful campaigns at this point. Our list is up to about 55 titles. And I would say at the very least, uh, 40 of those were funded through crowdfunding. And what? what platform do you use for your career? Is it always Kickstarter or have you done other ones as well? Primarily I've used Kickstarter, but I have used Indiegogo for select projects. And that's just a matter of there's more people on Kickstarter. I know that it's having problems right now, but there's still a lot more activity. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing so many there that we've built a following and we've built a reputation. Quality books delivered on time or early and Okay, well, stories so let's just define it too because i there was a question here about that not everyone quite understands what they mean when you say crowdsourcing um, we're talking about raising money for the book before the book is even published and if you don't raise enough money through these various facebook not on facebook various internet pages um then the book just doesn't get published mm -hmm. one of the advantages of that and you guys can tell me if, if i'm wrong in this matter as far as i can see is there's no commitments in a sense, you know, if you say, oh, I'll buy that book and you put your $20 down and somehow we don't raise enough and the book doesn't come out, you get, it's not like your $20 gets subtracted. Is that correct? You, you don't, they don't collect the money unless the campaign funds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or Kickstarter. Indiegogo, they collect the money, you know, the prod, you don't have to collect the entire goal on Indiegogo. Kickstarter, you do. Okay. And you okay. can make more than the goal so what we do is we very strategically set a modest goal that we know we can hit and hit quickly and then the sky's the limit from there uh yes the, the kickstarters that i've been involved with um have been sort of saying we figured okay if we if we paid each of our authors x amount per word and the book's going to be this big and this is our budget and this is how much it's going to cost to get the stuff printed so we need to raise mm -hmm. $5,000, whatever, to print the book and get everyone paid. Mm -hmm. And then if we raise $6,000, we can make the book even bigger. And if we raise $7,000, we can make the book even bigger. And then, you know, that that's one way to get people to pitch in and, and support your uh, campaign, I guess I should say. There's a danger there because the bigger you make the book, the more expensive it is to produce, mm -hmm. the higher you have to make the price, the less willing people are to buy it in after campaign so we keep a modest sized book try to keep the authors down we work on increasing the perceived value so our campaigns always have a lot of bonus content that the backers will receive and we build a relationship with them so they become like a little e-spec family we have a lot of people that come back from campaign to campaign and and will support us. And if like our most recent campaign was for two science fiction novels, in the end we ended up funding five books. And we had unlocked every single stretch goal except for the last one, which was hardcover omnibus editions. And in the last two days, we raised $2,400 to make that happen. <laughs> Excellent. That's, that must have felt great. A uh, so, couple more quick questions before we run out of time and see sorry. if anyone has any. Uh, sorry, if you have a good story, I'll stop for a good story okay. anytime. Ask questions. Ask questions. Okay. Um, how do you pick the right keywords for your book to reach readers? You know, I, I assume, uh, Sahar, you mean like on Amazon when you're, when you're putting your book up and they or just, I guess, any search engine would want. Um, it, it, 
I never quite got the grasp of the search engine optimization. So I just pick things that are relevant to the book, things that I know that are popular. Um, we have a, I've seen people use like the names of their characters as keywords, but nobody searches for a character for a book they haven't read before. Correct. Exactly. Correct. Now, keep in mind, there is a little bit of an abuse for this as well. Imagine, if you will, you write a mystery. You then use the keywords for every major mystery author that has ever been. So that if someone's searching, you pop up. Now, keep in mind, this isn't formally illegal yet, but they're working on it. So there is an abuse of keywords on the other end of the spectrum. Good point. You don't want to be the jerk who, who lures people in falsely through bad advertising, I guess. That I get really idea. pissed off if I'm looking for an author and instead like 10 other authors show up. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Tied into that is how do you, how important is it to nail your genre, especially when you cross over a bunch? Oh. You know, you're writing <laughs> mystery, adventure, science fiction, you know, romance, you know, how do, what, what do you do? How do you promote I, it? I think the more that you cross genres, the more you narrow your potential audience. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because a lot of people get tired of the same old regurgitation of ideas and they want something new. But you have to be clear in your representation, like when you're, when you're doing the book cover, that it's obvious that it is a mashup of those two things so that people that would be totally turned off by that don't buy it and then get pissed off because it was something that they weren't expecting if it's obvious it's die hard meets the wizard of oz you know <laughs> then you know yeah. yeah go ahead and make sure that in other words make sure everyone knows what they're getting into you don't want someone buying a book thinking it's a romance and then it has an unhappy ending because that's not a romance anymore yeah so make sure you know well, additionally, mechanically, on the back of the book, just above the barcode, we have the genre of what they call shelf placement. So you know what it is, or at least how we're classifying it. Mm. I guess the, the question is more for the author who's self-publishing. How do they pick what their book's genre is, you know, if it, if it crosses over? And that's the hard uh. one to decide. Because it's, it's, sometimes it's even hard to, sometimes it's hard to put your own books into those kind of genres. Yeah, it, and see, the, the whole thing is, is readers aren't really looking for the pigeonhole of what a book is, the libraries and the bookstores are. So it's not vital. I think it'd be more vital if you were trying to write a cover letter, a query letter to an agent. Yeah. 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 But for so your own sales. Publish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to explain to yourself what the book is. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it all right well as we're running out of time we're going to ask uh, you guys to give us a little pitch tell us what's going on uh, hold up your your self-help book especially oh uh, yeah be, i don't have it here oh uh, well tell us about it <laughs> uh, because that's certainly library. something our, our people would be interested in and just let us know what's going on before we sign off okay well eSpec has been proceeding even during these difficult times we haven't really slowed down mm -hmm. we have a lot of new books coming out um a new author named Megan Mackey, who does a mashup of magic and we, cyberpunk. She was my guest last week, you know. Exactly, yeah. And um, David Sherman is a longtime, well-respected military science fiction author, and his last ever science fiction, military science fiction, is going to be coming out later this year. Um, I did, for those that weren't necessarily here at the beginning, I just released a build a book workshop, which goes over the nuts and bolts of actually constructing a book, what goes where, what the dimensions typically are in the industry, and, and shares a bit more than that too. It gives you some insight into publishing and, and book can you, design. Can you type that address, uh, the link over there in the uh, chat area for us? And that way what we'll put I will do is I'm going to type for the eSpec book website, uh, the, the Square Store. And all of the books that I've mentioned mm -hmm. are readily viewed there. Excellent. Without Mark, do you have anything you want to add to that? Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add? Every book she described, I have to do cover work. <laughs> work for. I have seven projects that all suddenly backed up to the last five days of this month. What fun. Yeah. 
All right. Well, we appreciate you being here with us and answering our questions, folks. It's great to see you again. Some of you who've been around long enough remember these guys from our very, very, very first <laughs> conference years ago now, it seems. I love the mugs. And if we didn't address your question, you can just look us up on Facebook and, you know, let us know what you wanted to know that we didn't cover. Because there's well, next... a lot for, for this oh. topic. There's a lot of things that we, we had to gloss over or didn't even get to hit. Exactly. Um, next week, I'm going to be talking to uh, Mark Wade and Peter David, who are both pretty famous uh, writers for comic books, graphic novels, and Peter David does novels as well. So we're going to discuss the difference and what they have to go through in order to make their ideas fit into a panel, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's a real skill and it ought to be an interesting conversation, I hope. So thank you, everybody. Good night. Now, Mike, we can stop the recording now. So uh, don't.